classmate last year in an independent study class. So did a research project over the summer. He's, done, he's a senior he at Stony Brook, interested in algebraic geometry. And yeah, why don't you uh, go ahead. Hi. Good to see you guys again. <laughs> um, all right, so I guess we shall start for Yeah. All right, so um, today I will be presenting a talk on algebraic curves. And I want to showcase how um, the studying of curves can easily interplay between algebraic geometry and topology. So it, although it's like algebraic geometry, but in this case you can see a lot of like, interplay between the fields and to motivate for studies in the area. All right, so I'll split my presentation into three parts, basically. So the first part is about the algebra. So I will establish some basic definitions. Uh, and then it's the topology. Uh, so now we have some pictures. We, we look at what the shape looks like. And then it's finally some geometry. So we look at the intersection of curves um, and talk about Bayesian's theorem. And finally, we talk about something uh, about the singularities of a curve and how that affects the geometry. All right, so what are algebraic curves? The short, uh, the short answer is it, it is a zero set to a polynomial equation. So, uh, so we are looking at curves. So in this case, I'll, I'll say a curve is a, a plane curve, so something defined in, in the plane. Of, so we have two variables, and we have a polynomial equation. The zero set of that polynomial equation will give us something that uh, looks like a curve. So an example is, x squared plus y squared minus 1. Zero set of this polynomial in R2, in a real um, plane, is just a circle. And y squared equals to x, that's a parabola. But um, uh, I'm reading this in a different way, but it's like y squared minus x equals to 0. Right, so I'm talking about polynomial equations, but we all know that there, there are real solutions to it, and there are complex solutions to it. So the question is, do we consider the equations to be all the complex numbers, like we consider all the complex solutions, or do we consider just the real numbers? The, and this, it, this makes a crucial difference. So for example, if we look at the equation x squared plus y squared equals to zero, well, what, what is the solution set if we only allow x and y to be real numbers? Well, that's, that's just the point. That's just the origin. But if you look at the complex solution, then uh, is the union of two lines, y equals to plus minus ix, right, that's, that's a line. Also, of a complex curve, I should say it's a complex line, so it's a, it's a real plane, you should say. Uh, but it turns out that working with complex numbers is more natural in the setting of, of um, algebraic curves, because complex numbers have a lot better, um, behave a lot better than the real numbers. For example, C is algebraically closed, so every polynomial over complex numbers, non-constant polynomial over complex numbers has at least one root. And also um, complex differentiable functions, they are uh, holomorphic, called holomorphic functions, but they are complex analytic in contrast to a real, you can just have a function that's, real function that's differentiable once, but it's not differentiable twice, but for a complex function that's not possible. If you have if it's once differentiable, it's infinitely differentiable and it's analytic. So throughout the, the whole study, we'll assume that our curve is defined over C. So we look at the complex solutions. Uh, but however well you draw the picture, because right, you have two complex variables, that's like C2, and that's a four-dimensional thing, I can't draw it here. So usually I would just draw the picture of the real curve. Right, now we uh, establish some preliminaries. So let f x y to be a non-zero polynomial. So first thing, the degree of a monomial. A monomial is a term like looks like s i y r y j. And the degree of this is just the sum of the uh, exponents. The degree of f is the highest degree of this monomial. And the, the polynomial is called homogeneous of degree d. If when you multiply the two, R, two variables by some constant lambda, then you can pull out the constant lambda here, but the actual factor of d here. And or you can say that all, you can, 
you can say that Sorry. it is the same as requiring all monomials of f to have the same degree. So I gave two examples of a complex, uh, of a homogeneous polynomial. The first one uh, has degree two. You can see all its monomials are of degree two. And then the second one has degree four. It has two monomials, each has degree four. Now each polynomial you can decompose it into a sum of homogeneous ones. Uh, it's very simple. You just collect all the terms with all the monomials with degree one, uh, degree zero, degree one, degree two, and etc. So, so you write it as f zero plus f one all the way to f n, and each f i is called homogeneous part of degree i. Okay. Now back to some geometry. So we have a curve defined by f x y equals to zero. So the degree of the curve is the degree of its defining equation. Now we say a curve is irreducible if uh, the polynomial cannot be factored into the product of two non-constant polynomials. Uh, that's the algebraic definition, but if you're looking at geometry, so, so, so for example, like if you have a point here and a line here, uh, that basically means that uh, it's the algebraic step that is like reducible because it can be written as the as to the union of two um, proper subset. That, that's the algebraic uh, variety, what you call. So, so the example I gave here is that um, the line x minus y equals to zero is irreducible, but x squared plus y squared that's the product of two polynomial non-constant polynomial of strictly lower degree. And you can see that it's a union of two lines intersecting at zero. Right. So you need two lines looking like this. And so you can write the, the set as a union of two um, algebraic sub varieties. Right. So the first thing is every curve you can uh, you can write it as a union of finitely many irreducible components. Uh, and then in, in this case, in the x squared plus y squared equals to zero case, it's the two, two lines crossing at the origin. Right, so that's the, that's the picture we have. All right. All right, so now we know what a curve is. So now we want to ask, what, what do I mean when I say the curve is singular at some point? So if, let's assume that uh, the curve is defined by f, f of x, y is 0. So if we have any point on the curve, you can make a linear change of coordinate. Uh, so to, to assume that the point is the origin of the coordinate system. So you can just study the, uh, you can just assume that a, b is the origin, 0, 0. Right, so how do you find the time tangents to, to the curve at 0, 0? Now from calculus, you know that the equation of the tangent is given by the partial derivatives of x with respect to x evaluated at 0, 0 times x plus the partial derivative of, uh, with respect to y evaluated at 0, 0. If both partials don't vanish at 0, that's just, that's, that's just basically calculus. So, but, so we can reformulate this in the following way. By decomposing uh, f into the sum of homogeneous parts. You can see that the first partial is just f1. Uh, you can see that the polynomial here is just f1. So we really know that the tangent is given by the equation. It's given by the curve f1 equals to zero, and that's a that's a that's a line, right? It's like ax plus by equals to zero. So that gives you a line. What is what is the homogeneous part? <laughs> uh, okay, so. So if you have a polynomial, you can write each, uh, you can collect all the monomials of the same degree into one term. That gives you a homogeneous polynomial. So the homogeneous part is when you um, just decompose the general polynomial uh, into the sum of homogeneous polynomials. Okay. Right, so, so I, I said that the curve is given by f1 equals to 0, right? But what if f1 is just a 0 polynomial? So the equation is 0 equals to 0. That's the whole plan. It's, it's no longer a line. This basically shows that the, def, the definition is not good if you're, the, all the first partials are zero, right? So, 
now if we remove all the, the um, homogeneous parts that are, that are just 0 0.0, then we can write f equals to fk plus fk plus 1. So where fk is the homogeneous part of the lowest degrees that's not 0. So, so the tangent cone at 0, 0, we define it to be the curve fk equals to 0. <coughs> the multiplicity is defined to be k. Now if we know that if k equals to 1, that means that the at least one of the first partial is not zero. Then the point is called a smooth point or a regular point. If k is at least two, then it's a singular point of multiplicity k. So because we know that the tangent line is a linear approximation to, uh, to f at zero, zero, so basically we just regard, uh, we throw away all the higher order terms and look only at the linear term. So in the, in the same spirit, you can think of the tangent cone which only contains the lowest term, like we throw away all the fk plus 1 and, and the higher terms. That gives you the collection of all tangent directions through 0, 0. Uh, finally, an observation that if you have a reducible curve, and so the, the curve cannot be smooth at the intersection point of these two irreducible components. If we look at the x squared plus y squared equals to 0 thing, you see that you have two irreducible components crossing at zero, right? So at zero, there's like two tangent direction. One is through this, this irreducible component, the other is through this irreducible component. So a reducible curve cannot be smooth everywhere. If, if it's in the uh, irreducible components intersect, there, there could be, you, you can't you can have like a point intersect a lot, a uh, union a line that doesn't intersect anywhere, so it's smooth. Okay, so now this, now, now this, um, please take a look at this, um, this picture. It's called the nodal curve. Uh, y squared equals to x squared plus x cubed. This curve is singular at 0, 0. Because you can, you can, as you can see, the lowest, uh, it doesn't have any linear term. The lowest homogeneous part is, um, has degree 2. And you can, and I, I just said that the tangent cone is a approximation to the curve at 0, 0. And you can, you can kind of see this because near 0, 0, the curve you are looking at, the curve locally looks like the union of two lines, right? If you, if you just zoom in. And that, that is precisely the zero set of y squared minus x squared equals to 0. That's x plus y times x minus y. So it's two lines. So now we know that if you have a smooth point, the tangent cone to the smooth point is just f1 is equal to 0, that's a line. So what if you have a singular point? Right, so the theorem is that the tangent cone is a finite union of lines. So it's not too far away from being a line, but it's, you have multiple tangent directions at a singular point. Proof is this. If you have a point in the tangent cone, then you see that after you scale the coordinates by, by some scalar, because fk is homogeneous, so the scalar point is still in the tangent cone. Which means that if the, the cone contains one point, it, it contains every point uh, on the line defined by the point we were just talking about. So, so the tangent cone is a union of lines, which explains why it is called a cone. Because if you, if you have a, if you think of a cone that's like through the origin, Right, that's, that's, that's a union of lines. That, that's, that, so this, this is a picture of a cone. So that's the union of a line. Right, so if every line through the origin is given by alpha x plus beta y equals to zero, uh, with alpha beta not all zero, if you plug the variables into back to the equation and you, and you solve it, so basically it will become a polynomial in uh, in the ratio alpha over beta or beta over alpha, depending on maybe y is zero or like some, something like that. Um, then you, you see, because it's a complex polynomial in finitely many uh, a finite degree, so you can so the, the slope which are determined by alpha and beta, they can only take finitely many values. And this is this is what uh, this is one place you can see why it is good to work over complex numbers. Because if we're looking at uh, the, 
because if you allow complex solutions, then this is a degree k polynomial when you like do all the substitution. So it will have exactly k solutions when you count the multiplicity uh, properly. But if you're doing the real polynomials, in, in the real case, it's not so easy. Okay, so we know that the tangent cone here is the, a finite union of k lines if you count multiplicity. So if you have exactly k distinct lines at t, then you say the singular point is an ordinary k point. So the example would be, so some common terminology would be a double point or a triple point. Um, okay. Next slide. So, so the, so the okay, can I go back to the nodal yeah. curve? Do you want the nodal curve? Oh, the nodal curve? Yeah, so the nodal curve here, the singularity at 0, 0, this would be an ordinary double point because you have two distinct tangents uh, passing through 0. All right. Okay. All right, so this concludes my discussion on the algebra of curves. Uh, are there any questions? You want to briefly say like the fundamental theorem of algebra? Like oh, okay. Uh, okay. So the fundamental theorem of algebra is that if you have any non-constant polynomials with complex coefficients, then it has at least one root. So as a as a corollary, so in fact every polynomial, every non-constant polynomial would have exactly the degree of it many complex roots if you count multiplicity. All right, so any other question? All right, so now let's get into topology. So we say an algebraic curve, right? What is a curve? A curve is basically a one-dimensional thing. You can think, think of it like as a line or that's, that's the best way to look at it. But, but if it's a one-dimensional complex object, it's a complex, it's defined over the complex numbers. So if we go back to the real case, it's really a two-dimensional real object, so usually Norm is called it a surface, but algebraic geometers call it a curve. Okay, so if you you have a curve that doesn't does not have any singular point, then you can use a, a theorem called implicit function theorem for for complex analytic functions. Uh, that and to prove that it, you have a smooth manifold of complex dimensional one or real dimensional two. Now uh, I I know so for for manifolds you can just think of it as a uh, generalization of curves and surfaces because I don't want to get into the formal definitions. Um, but, but, but basically it means that locally every point looks like uh, if you have, a, you have a surface then it means that locally there's a neighborhood looks like, looking look like an open disk. Right, a complex one dimensional manifold is also called a Riemann surface. So one thing I should mention about the, the, the difference between a general surface and a, a Riemann surface, like a one-dimensional complex manifold, is that the complex manifold is always orientable. Like, you, like we know that like in the real case, you have a, the Mobius band that's kind of like a surface, but it's not orientable because you have, you, you can, you, there's no like inside and outside or all sorts of, sorts of things, but it's that, that doesn't happen with Riemann surfaces doesn't happen with complex manifolds. Now, I have been talking about the equations like as if they are a subset of C2, um, or the product of the complex plane with itself. But to make the theory, theory, uh, theory works better is it actually, we might want to uh, compactify the curve. So this, this, so this means that I consider a curve in projected plane. Now, is is kind of technical. So, so if, if so, basically, if you have a plane here, right? Think about you have like two parallel lines. Then these two lines they don't intersect, right? But but we want to you know get a, make the theory better. So we just say we just want to say like all lines intersect at exactly one point. So what do we do? So you add a point at infinity. So the, so the basic idea would be the two lines would intersect at the point at, at infinity if they don't intersect at the, at, um, in the plane. So that, 
correspond to enclosing the plane. So that makes it into something like a sphere. Right. This is the actual point of infinity you have here. And you can convert it back to the real to the to the uh, affine plane picture by stereographic projection from the North Pole. Uh, so this is basically the idea. But I, I don't I don't want to spend too much time on what, defining what is a projective plane. So let's just uh, so I'll, I'll so if a theorem only works in the projective case, I was I would say it, but let's uh, let, let's keep going. All right, so if we consider the curve in the projective plane, then the curve is compact, so it's like kind of like being enclosed, it's not like going off to infinity or anything. If then each real surface is a compact orientable surface. Now if you take if you take a course in topology or or, or ge geometry, they will say that there's a classification theorem for compact orientable surfaces. That each surface you have is topologically a G hole torus. And G is called the genus of the Riemann surface or algebraic curve. Let me go to the next slide. Right, so here's some picture of uh, two-dimensional compact orientable surfaces. So for genus zero, you have the sphere because there's no hole. For genus one, you have the torus with one hole, and genus two, you have the two-hole torus, and etc. Right. Uh, now some. Now I'll talk about a fine example. So let's consider the algebraic curve given by the affine equation, by the equation y squared equals to alpha, and times all the, and times the cubic polynomial in x. This is a smooth curve if and only if the three rules are distinct complex numbers. And in this case, we call the, the resulting shape, the resulting projective curve, uh, called an elliptic curve. Uh, the terminology is a bit confusing because an elliptic curve does not, it, it's not really related to an eclipse. Uh, people uh, said that you, you, one might want to call it a parabolic curve. <laughs> but the, so the name elliptic comes from the connection to elliptic integrals. And I don't, okay, that's, that, that's just some history. So the curve has genus one, and so it's topologically a torus. Right, again, the terminology is confusing. You say it's a curve, but the topologically it's really a toy, it's a donut. And the one thing that's interesting about these curves is that the topology does not determine the curve. So all elliptic curves, they are they are they look like a torus in the right, it's a topological domain. But if you but they are not the same as complex manifold. So it means that you, so to, so they are topologically the same the same meaning that you can transform one elliptic curve into another by a continuous uh, transformation with continuous inverse. So if they are the same as complex manifold, then you, the map you are using cannot be just continuous. You need them to be a complex differentiable or called, and in this case the map is called by holomorphism, whereas algebraic curves. So now you are using algebraic maps, and in, in this case they are called isomorphic. But fortunately, elliptic curves are very well uh, understood. So there's a, there's a number, there's an invariant of curves called the J invariant. If you have two curves and then you know that they're defined equation, you can calculate the J invariant. And the curves are isomorphic if and only if they have the same J invariant. Okay. All right, so now we are, we, we, we're looking at a smooth curve. We, we know that a smooth curve is a G whole torus. But what about singular curves? Call that a, uh, an algebraic curve to be single, curve, like not all curves are smooth. If we look at another curve, y squared equals to the x squared plus x cubed, you know that near the origin it looks like two intersecting straight lines, right? So near zero zero. Okay, so near zero zero, it looks like two complex lines crossing at the origin. Now this is a real picture, but if you're looking at the complex picture, you know that a, a line segment here, what is it? it? It's a small open set in the complex plane centered at the origin, so it's, it's like open disk. So you have like these two are open disk and they only touch at one point. 
So the, the, the picture would be something look like this. So you have two things that looks like this that touch only at one point. Now we can generalize this operation to other uh, singularities. So you can you can guess that near the single near a singular point, the curve looks like finitely many open disks with their center glued together. Now this is this is true, but the proof is uh, quite involved. You need some complex analysis to do it. So you either need the Weierstrass preparation theorem or like do some like analytic continuation. So we can we skip the proof. So here's uh, here, so here's a normal curve, but we look at it through topology. So topologically, it's really a two-hole torp. Right? It's, it's really just a sphere with two points glued together. And you can see like near the singular point here, this is a singular point. And near it, it looks like two open disks with their center glued together. All right, now given this picture, and we know that all the single, near all the singular points, you just some open disk with their center glued together. So a natural thing to do is just to try to separate the, the, the points. So then we can construct what is called a normalization or desingularization of the curve. What is it? So let C be a curve with singularity at P1 to PK. Then you can construct a compact ribbon surface, so which means that it is a smooth algebraic curve, projective curve. And it's called the normalization or desingularization. And to the, together uh, with the map, sigma, such that the pre images of the singular points at the C are finite collection of points. And then outside the singular points and their pre images, your map is a compact analytic isomorphism. So, so we know, because we know how, what the local topology of singular points are like. So it's, it's quite obvious to construct the scene. You can you just separate all the points, uh, all the singular points, right? And then the map you get is by uh, not changing anything outside the singular points, but you, then you move, you merge the separate point, you pinch the separate points together. Uh, but you have to prove that sigma has some like has a property you, you want. Can we go back? Yeah, so in, so in this picture, the desingularization would be something, um, we can just separate this point, right? We, we just unpinch the two points, and that gives us a, a sphere. Now, a sphere is also known as a complex projective line. Um, so, 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 uh, so, so what is that? Okay. So what the argument says is that if you have, you have the nodal curve, if you have to know the curve, then when you uh, unpinch this singular point, what you get is a straight line. And this is kind of obvious, right? This looks like a straight line. All right. Find some terminology. So the two curves, so the two curves C and there is normalization C to the, uh, they are both birational, uh, basically because they are isomorphic on a dense open subset. They are they are they are only different uh, on the set of like singular points and their pre images. And if you have a curve, it's rational. It is called rational if its normalization is just a sphere or the complex projective line. So that's. So there's a whole field called birational geometry. It, it deals with the, like birational properties of like varieties. Right? Any questions on the on the topological stuff? Yeah. Is the complex um, projective um, plane is it orientable or no? Um, what? The complex projective plane. The complex projective plane. Yeah. What is it? Is it orientable or? Oh, it's um, always orientable. All all complex manifolds are orientable. If you, you are, they're actually canonically orientable if you choose if you choose an I, if you fix an orientation of the complex plane. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I also did have one question, which is a complex analytic isomorphism. 
does that just mean um, an invertible map, which is complex differentiable? Yeah. It's because of... Uh, yes, the that. Inverse, right? uh, Actually, the situation for complex maps are nicer. Like for a continuous map, you can have a continuous bijection, but with no, but the inverse is not continuous. But if you have a complex analytic bijection, that is automatically a, a biholomorphism. Like this inverse is also holomorphic. So another reason why complex numbers are so nice because complex differential functions that have many good properties that just are not simply not true for smooth functions or uh, differential functions. Any other questions? All right. So, so finally, let's get to the geometry. Now, I I I, was, I talk about like the topology of local of singularities. I talk about what the tangent cone looks like, but the first. The first definition I give about curves is the degree of a curve, but I have not said anything about it. Now let's get back to the degree of a curve. And that, I think, is, ha is a, a quantity that has geometric significance. So, so first let's look at the following picture. So how, so how many points do two circles intersect? I want to guess. What's the number of intersection points of two circles? Well, then you this you see well okay I shouldn't say circles because it's, um, it, I should say conics it, because this these two are not um, circles <laughs> right one is eclipse so I should really say conics um, all right so 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 back question so these two conics you see you can see that they intersect at four points right but you can also have bad cases where they only intersect at one point. So the idea, so the idea of geometry is basically we only speak of general objects. Like you have two lines, then these two lines. Here you're talking about the real solutions to the intersection, right? Uh, yeah, the real thing. Yeah, this. I just want to give some intuition to the, the situation. So you think? First. It's a nice problem. <laughs> Profit. Uh, oh. Here. All right, so if you, have, yeah, if you all right, let's get back to the real picture. So you have two lines that play, right? You know that two parallel only, uh, they don't intersect only if they are parallel to each other. But it basically means that if you change the slope a little bit, like you, you just diverge from the parallel one uh, a little bit, then you will intersect the other line at some point. So this means that so the collection of lines that does not inter that, that does not intersect this line is kind of rare, right? You you need to you need this slope to be just one number. And if the slope is not the same as the slope of this, these two lines will intersect. The idea is that two general so if you give two lines, so in general they will intersect at one point. There could be bad cases where you have like parallel lines, but these are rare. So let's go to the next slide. So these two FSA circles, they are like they are so the, the picture we we saw before, they are degree two curves, and then you can see that they can they will intersect at four equals to two times two points in general. Right? For lines it's like one times one. So they will in general they will intersect at one point. If you have any degree d curve defined by this equation f x y equals to zero. Then you can you can substitute x. Um, you, can substi you can you can look at this intersection with the line y equals to kx plus b. So basically, it means that you substitute the value of this. Uh, you substitute y for kx plus b. Now this is now this is a degree d polynomial. For most values of k and b, if you don't choose them so badly that the the curve uh, the the top degree term just vanishes. So, and this will have the solutions. Hence, it means that you have a degree D curve. The curve will intersect at the general line at D points if you count multiplicity uh, to take, up, take account of the, the multiple roots. Now, this is, this is a special, special case of uh, 
the theorem of Bayes' theorem that talks about the intersection of curves. Right? So now some terminology of the intersection. So now that let's look at two distinct irreducible curves, C and C prime. We want to define the, their intersections. So the intersection number C times C prime is defined as the sum of uh, overall intersection points, their multi the multiplicity, uh, which I denoted by C dot C prime parentheses P. Uh, that's the intersection multiplicity uh, is a little bit involved to define uh, because you need to take the normalization and you look at the degree of the normalization map, etc. But basically, it's the same idea. You can put it purely algebraically by the set of, by the result of there. Yes, um, you can. Yes, you can define it algebraically, um, but the definition is even more complicated. <laughs> so, the so basically the intersection multiplicity. If you, if you have something that looks like z squared, then that would be the multiplicity too. Uh, all right, so I don't want to get into it, just I'll do some properties. So you have two arbitrary curves, such that they don't share a common irreducible component. I right? recall that if you, they, they sh you have the same line in intersect itself, um, it's kind of bad because it will be infinitely many intersection points. Uh, so, so we we decompose the curves into irreducible components, and we define the intersection number uh, by extension of linearity. So we define define it to be the product, the intersection product of the irreducible components. Now there are some obvious properties of the intersection form, of the intersection number. The first is symmetric. Um, so C intersect dot C prime equals to C prime dot C. So it doesn't, it's obvious, this is intersectional geometric property. It doesn't change what, in what order are you considering the curves. Now if you have two curves intersect transversely at a point, then the intersection multiplicity is one. Uh, transfer, transversality is, uh, is, is, is needs some definition, but basically if you, so the point here would be a, a transverse intersection. So anything that just looks like your normal intersection would be transverse. Just use your intuition. And if you have a singular point on the curve, on any of the curve, then the intersection multiplicity will be greater than one. This can be seen by intersecting the curve with a with a line, right? Because the lowest degree would have degree two, so the order of bump vanishes at least two, so it will be higher than one. Now, we, now I say this actually is possible to define the self-intersection of a curve. Then you can say, okay, obviously a curve intersect the set theoretic intersection of a curve with itself would be infinite many points. How can you define multiplicity? Uh, so one way, one way to do it, uh, one possible intuitive way to do it is that you move the curve a little bit. So for example, you have a cur curve here, right? You have a line here. You want to define the intersection number of the line with itself. So you can imagine like slightly deforming the curve, move the curve a little, a little bit, and then these two will intersect transversely. Now this is one way to do it, but actually in algebraic geometry, this is not always possible. Because you can have negative self-intersection. You can have curve that intersect with itself at negative one points. So like how does this make sense? The, the, the key thing is you can't just move the curves. This is this called region is region. You can move the curves so that they intersect transversely. Alright, so but I'm not getting into this. Alright, so final basis theorem. If you have two curves in projective plane without common irreducible components, then the number of intersection points is just the product of their degree counted with multiplicity. Okay, so Bayes' theorem tells us that the degree of a curve it has geometric content. It tells you the general number of points of intersections with another curve. So, and we know that at a singular point, the intersection multiplicity would be would be would not be one, would be at least two. So, in some sense, the singularities also affect the geometry. So, here is one uh, was, is one interesting example. That's not very easy to see. If you have a curve of degree four, I think the terminology is uh, 
40 or 100 or some, something, I can't remember. <laughs> but if you have a curve of degree 4 and it has four singular points, the, it has to be reducible, so it's not irreducible. Why, why is this? First, because the intersection multiplicity at singular points, these are at least two. So by Bayesian's theorem, right, you can pass, so you, you, you take a pair of inter, uh, singular points, you, you pass a line through them. Bayesian's theorem to, tells you that the total number of intersections would be four, but you have two singular points, right? So, the, so all the singular points must be double points, with no three are collinear. Because if you have three collinear points, then take a line through them, the line will intersect the curve at uh, six points, but the, curve, the product of their degree is only four. So another uh, a classical fact in the geometry is that you have to take five points in general position, meaning that those three points are collinear, then you, you can find a conic passing through them. Uh, now we know that you, if you take three distinct points in the plane, that determines a circle, right? Uh, two points determine a line. Uh, for a conic, meaning that you take per, like parabola, hyperbola, eclipse, and, and circles into account, you need five points. Uh, actually, five general points. Okay, so determines a conic. Now, if we pick any other point, I'll say that's in general position with the four singular points. And then you consider, you take a conic passing through the five points. Uh, recall that a conic is a curve of degree two. So you see that the intersection product is at least nine. Why? Because you have four, point, four double points. So that gives you uh, a multiplicity at least eight. And then you intersect, uh, and there's another extra intersection point, so it's like nine. And then, no, no battery. No, do something about it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, right, but the, the product of a degree is only eight. So this, this cannot happen because it contradicts Bayesian's theorem, unless these two curves share a common irreducible component. But if you have a degree two curve, uh, a degree two curve is a, curve, a irreducible component of a degree four curve, right? Then basically it means that the degree four polynomial has to factor into a degree two times something, degree two. Okay. So that's one application of Bayesian's theorem. There are like many others relating the singular points and the geometry of the curve. Here's another. Here's another one. That's basically the last major thing of, of this presentation. Uh, I know it's, it's a lot, but please be with me. The, the the theorem is called degree genus formula. The key thing. The key thing is like the degree is the is the geometry of the curve, right? The general number of intersection points. The genus. On the other hand, the topology is the many counts how many holes the, the surface has, and we want and the theorem says that these two are not independent from each other; they are related by the degree genus formula. So if you have a degree d curve in the projective plane, and the normalization has genus g, the g is d minus one times d minus two over two minus the number of singular points. So in particular, if delta is uh, delta is zero, so the curve is smooth, then the genus is related to is equals to the product here. And recall that, recall that in topology, the genus determine the compact variable surface, right? Because every two such surface having the same genus would be homeomorphic. But if the genus for the smooth curve only depends on the degree, that means that all the all curves of the, all smooth curves of the same degree would be homeomorphic. Actually, they are diffeomorphic. But that's, that's a stronger result because they have the same genus. Right. Next right. right. So the application um, let's say a few things. So first, the elliptic curves. They are degree three curves. They are defined by cubic polynomials. So they have genus one. Like what I said before, they are like two torus. They are just topologically torus. If you have a line and smooth conics, they have genus zero. So they are rational. So I shouldn't say they're rational. So they are basically uh, just a projected line, or they're topologically just looks like a sphere. Here's another advantage of working with complex numbers. Because over the complex numbers, all smooth conics, they just look the same. 
they're actually all called projectively equivalent. But if you have looking at the real affine picture, right, a, a circle is not the same as a hyperbola or a parabola. But over complex numbers, these are unified into one thing. Another application is that a degree D curve cannot have more than uh, these many singularities. Why? Because its normalization can make, cannot have negative genus. Genus is at least zero. And this is another surprising thing, like, like you have a curve here having, um, having one singularity, right? So if you might imagine you can just I don't know, wiggle the curve so that it, it looks something, I don't know, like this. And so you have you have many singular points, but that's actually not possible if you if you if you don't change the degree of the curve. So 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 the number of singularities is actually related to geometric properties, and it's not arbitrary. Right. Right. So that's basically all I have for today. Um, thanks for listening. The theory of algebraic curves is an inter is a rich interaction between algebra geometry and topology, as seen by the examples I presented. And if you want to learn something about this subject, you can approach it from numerous angles. You can do it from algebraic geometry, uh, so as solutions to complex uh, to polynomial equations, or through complex geometry, take them as complex one-dimensional manifolds, and then you can look at uh, their default numbers or uh, differential forms. You can do this from algebraic topology, uh, so look at like fundamental group, their homology groups, or from, even from number theory. There's a whole field uh, in, uh, in number theory that basically deals with elliptic curves. It's, it's, very, it's a very classical subject, and there's numerous open questions. And Stony Brook is very strong at algebraic geometry, and so if you are interested, you can ask a professor to do a reading course, and it's actually quite good. We're, we're very good at geometry and topology. All right, so yeah, so this is the end. Um, I'm open.